Welcome back to a beginner's commentary to the book of Genesis with me, Michael Lawson Speaks. This is chapter two. And if you missed chapter one, go watch that now so that you're watching these in order. So I'll say it again. You wouldn't start reading any book starting in chapter two or watching any series in season two. So you go do that now, and I'll see you here when you get back. Hey, welcome back to those of you who just finished watching chapter two. You haven't missed anything, as we are just getting started. So I want to remind you who this teaching series is for. It is for the beginner. The person just starting their walk with the Lord, or even the person who's read the Bible before and even heard sermons on this before, but it still didn't make sense. If that's you, then you're in the right place. And let me just reiterate that we're only interpreting Scripture that is before us in the plain sense without trying to read into scripture what isn't there, or even over-spiritualizing or hyper-spiritualizing scripture, which we see way too often. So let's get into chapter 2 with verses 1 through 3. And so the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their heavenly lights. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because on it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Okay, let's break down day seven. God completes his work on the seventh day and does something that he reserved only for living things. He blesses it, and even more so than that, he sanctified it. But what does that even mean to sanctify? Simply put, to set apart. Holy. So God set apart the seventh day from all the other days and made it holy. Now, a quick side note, I did a video on sanctify that you should check out that goes in depth. Now, let us not forget that some pretty amazing things happened in those six days, but the seventh day is so special that God blessed it and then set it apart as holy. Okay, let's, let's recount what God blessed up to this point, seven days into the creation of the world and every living thing and take note of the fact that these are seven blessings and seven in the Bible is significant. Now it's too early to talk about it now because this commentary, this teaching is only covering what is in the text at the time we are reading it. But I digress. Back to the seven blessings. One, living creatures that swarms the waters. Two, birds that fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Three, great sea creatures and every living creature that moves. Four, livestock. Five, crawling things on the land. Six, mankind, male and female. Seven, the seventh day. Continuing on in verses 4 through 7, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub on the field was yet on the earth and yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. 
Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Let's break down these verses that I'm titling the creation of man. But first, chapter one gave us a summary of the creation of the world. Now, chapter two begins to tell the story of that creation in more detail, beginning with the crown jewel, mankind. Remember, God spoke it, and it was so, and it was good. However, with mankind, God forms from the dust, from the ground, and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life in order that he would become a living person. Already we see how unique man is in that he is unlike any other created thing because he is formed, which speaks of intimacy, precision, and most of all, love. Imagine for a moment the absolute level of closeness involved in order to breathe into his nostrils so that he would become a living, breathing creature. Now, to me, that speaks of how close and intimate man is intended to be with the Creator God. Okay, let's look at verses 8 and 9. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed out of the ground. The Lord God caused every tree to grow that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I have a question for you. Why are there two trees in the midst of the garden? Don't answer that question before we go through these next verses. Let's continue with verses 10 through 14. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The bedillium and the onyx stone are there as well. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, before we can break any of this down, we need to read verses 15 through 20. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on that day that you eat from it you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them a living creature, whatever the man called a living creature, that was the name the man gave. Names to all the livestock and to the birds of the sky, and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper helper for him. Okay, let's break down this portion of Scripture that I am calling the option. Man is created and escorted to a perfect garden with plenty of water to nourish the plants and trees to sustain the man perfectly. The options must have been endless with so many trees to choose from to satisfy mankind's hunger and drinking from the rivers to quench his thirst. However, without the prohibition to not do something, 
Mankind is nothing more than an animal. Without the ability to choose freely one thing from another, mankind is unable to act on his own. Therefore, you have the command from God to see if mankind will choose God or choose his own way. We cannot blame God for the consequences of our choices when we know better. That would be like blaming the police officer for pulling you over for speeding when you know the speed limit and then trying to use the excuse, I didn't know, when it's written on the driver's test and signs posted everywhere. Here's what I want you to notice. Notice how God makes very clear the consequences of a decision that is contrary to his command by stating, for on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. So what is God really saying? Remember that God is a spirit and man didn't become a living being until God breathed his spirit, the breath of life, into his nostrils. This is an important distinction because Satan is going to use these words against Eve in order to convince her that God is not being completely truthful. But before we can get there, let's continue reading with verses 21 through 25. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which had been taken from the man and brought her to the man. The, then the man said, At last, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Time to break down this portion of scripture I'm going to call Marriage Gets Defined. Okay, here we have the very first marriage, and it is ordained, presided over, and officiated by God himself. Through this, we get to see the heart of God and his view of marriage as being between one man and one woman forever. Notice how they become one flesh? I dare you. I dare you to try and separate a piece of meat and then join it to another piece of meat, or better yet, join a piece of chicken with a piece of meat from a pig and call it steak. You follow? Notice how the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. This speaks to them being completely open and exposed before each other with nothing to hide. They saw each other completely. Remember, God made mankind from the ground and then fashioned woman by taking a piece of man. He did not take a new batch of ground from the earth to form the woman and then bring him, then bring her to the man as his wife. Okay, that concludes chapter two. And I'll see you next time for chapter three. Don't forget the book. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Amen. See you in the next video.